<laughs> okay, thanks everybody for coming and uh, joining us for our panel discussion on practical applications for acting training. Um, I'm Melissa Whiteman. I work in student services as the administrative assistant, and our panel is, I'll start with Lori Jones. Lori is the uh, president of the director, wait, of the board of directors uh, Theater Off the Square, and she has a bachelor's in science and was a teacher for many years. And then James Brownlee, who is our theater director, instructor of the drama here. And <laughs> <laughs> I was about to start acting and I had to stop. Feel free to if you would like. Sorry. And then we also have um, our vice president of instruction, Mike Indy. And between the four of us, we just calculated we have over eight years' experience in acting. Um, so the panel is basically, we're here to answer questions for you all. Um, if you have any questions about using a theater degree afterwards, how you can use your theater degree, how you can even use your acting training in your everyday life, because we all do it and we may not even realize that we do it. I use it every day in student services and didn't really notice it until we had our meeting. <laughs> so um, I'll open it up if anybody has any questions or wants to start a topic off for us. How about if we tell them what our backgrounds are? Because oh, the vice okay. president didn't <coughs> set me up to do this. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Go ahead. <laughs> other than the fact that James and I are really care for one another and Moria as well, <laughs> probably don't know what we did. <laughs> Bachelor of Science, and why don't you okay, tell well, more about yourself? All right, I have a Bachelor of Science in Education from UT. Um, I am a retired teacher. I taught 33 years in uh, elementary education. However, I have a, uh, a fine arts background in that I was a choir person, actually, all through high school and in college. And I started out as a fine arts major, but ended up in education. And then, um, as time went on, I kept up my singing, but entered into theater because one day I saw an ad in the paper that said it was an audition for a theater off the square. And I thought about my teaching abilities and how when I read to my children at school, I become very animated. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, if I can do that, I can do something on the stage. So I went to the audition um, and got the lead, actually, which was very strange for your first time out. But it was a lot of fun. Um, and then I, I didn't do anything for just a couple of years because my daughters were involved with other things at the time. And then I got back into it, as did my husband. And so we've been involved with theater for about 15 years now. And so I do just about everything at the theater. <laughs> you have to do that in community theater. And I have branched out to other theaters as well, but I usually stay here pretty much. And, um, so I love it, and um, that's my experience. <laughs> my name is James Brownlee. I teach theater here at Weatherford College. I'm a Weatherford College, <coughs> College alumnus and Weatherford College theater alumnus. Uh, let's see, me, early years. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Um, I have Tourette syndrome. <laughs> I have Tourette syndrome. Um, now, that being said, I was not diagnosed until I was about 30 years old. Okay? Um, yeah, wow. Um, up until that time, I just thought I was, you know, peculiar. But um, <laughs> not that people with Tourette's are, but uh, it was like, oh, that's why that's happening. Um, but a couple of the possible ticks from having Tourette syndrome are a couple of things. Echolalia and palilalia. Echolalia is when you repeat something that someone else has said over and over and over and over again. Palilalia is when you repeat something that you've said over and over and over again. Consequently, when I started doing theater in middle school and later on in high school, uh, I was able to memorize lines very, very easily. And that's also how I learned to do all of my different accents, 
okay? British accent and French accent, Monty Python and the Holy Grail, many, many times, okay? Uh, it just, both of my parents uh, were, my mother was a singer, my dad was a musician, and so uh, they lived as artists for a good portion of their lives. Uh, they kind of tried to make me a musician, and I just didn't have the patience to learn to play anything. Uh, and I kind of came into this naturally, and I was very lucky in that <clears throat> my high school had an extracurricular, I mean, outside of, bless you, outside of the regular theater program, a, a, a fine arts program outside of that. And so a local theater company came and recruited us to go and perform Shakespeare for elementary schools. And that was it from there, really. Uh, I started apprenticing and interning uh, with those people. Uh, I went to Tarleton for four years and graduated with a BFA, and then I went off and became an actor. Um, you, as an actor, you have to go where the work is, which in 2001, that was Austin, Texas. And um, I had a really nice career doing theater and film and voice work. And, uh, but my calling has always been uh, to pass on what I know, uh, because people in my life, uh, from you know previous experience, had been actors and college professors, and I thought, what a lovely, wonderful life that is. Mm -hmm. And so, all these years later, here I am. And thank you, Weatherford College. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Oh. Um, yeah, <laughs> we're going to skip you, eh? Yeah. Well, I, I didn't even think of me. <laughs> <laughs> we do. Um, um, I started acting when I was 12, like just here and there, and then did it in elementary, and did it in um, junior high and high school, all the one act plays, and then when I was 18, I signed on with an agency to do it professionally, and did that for about seven years, and it was it was rough. It was very rough, and then I decided at one point that I wanted to make money that I could live on all the time instead of <laughs> <laughs> instead of just here and there. <laughs> and so then I started to look into. I became a paralegal, and then I left there, and I came to Weatherford College, and. I really, I got really tired of criminals, and <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to start helping people in a different area of life, and this has been a perfect fit for me, and it really does. My customer service experience ties into all of my theatrical training, and how I can talk to people, and I have no problem with talking to people, and that really does help quite a bit. Um, see, and then all in all, I added it all up today, and I think I have about 18, it's, I think it was 18 years total when I started to now. And then there's probably, I think it was like seven, seven to 10 years when I did it professionally. Um, okay, yeah, Mike. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, I'm the vice president here, and that's not why I'm here. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't, matter except for the end of this introduction. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wouldn't be here to speak as the Vice President at all, except that we're supposed to be talking about eventually how careers in the theater align with other things that you can do and jobs in the theater. So that's why I agreed to do this. I started in the theater because I was an ice hockey player and I did funny accents because that's how I stayed alive in southeastern Pennsylvania in a rough neighborhood. I could sound like a Hispanic kid and they needed someone to play the Hispanic kid, because Monty Python and the Holy Grail, you learn how to do funny voices. And that's the way I kept from getting beat up. I lived in a largely African-American neighborhood in where I grew up. And that wasn't the hostility. A lot of the hostility came from the other poor white guys, so, so you know that. Um, so that they cast me to play, and I played the Juan, and then the guy playing the lead who was a football player broke his leg and he couldn't walk, and they went, you can grow a beard at 15, and I went, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got to play the lead in the, in the junior class play, and, uh, and kiss Christy Dennis. 
which was cool because I was an ice hockey player and a goalie, so I was pale white, sweaty, and gross. And, you know, it was never going to happen. No young woman was ever going to want to be anywhere near me. <laughs> And I don't know that Chrissy did either. I never asked. But something worked that made sense between being an ice hockey player and being an actor, and that is the collaborative environment and the sense that we are working together to accomplish something. So I've always viewed sports and art as being very closely related. In fact, I used to teach people that they are the same thing. It's just the way that you define it and look at it. And some of the most beautiful artistic events I've ever seen happened in athletic competitions. Most recently, we celebrated the 40th anniversary of the Miracle on Ice, which is an incredible event in American history. So after I, I went to high school, decided acting. My father wanted me to be a doctor or a lawyer um, to go and help people using my mind because he was a steel worker. And he didn't want me to use my body. He was a, in that way. He was a union guy. And he literally got beat up on picket lines and all that stuff, which was pretty incredible because my dad was bigger than me and much meaner looking than I was. Mm -hmm. So I come by it naturally. Mm -hmm. When I went to college and told him I was going to major in theater, I started in journalism and those things. And, and he said, to my surprise, do it while you're young. And I did. And I went to school and I studied theater at Penn State University. And uh, I went on scholarships because I didn't have the money and Pell Grants, because I was first generation high school graduate. And um, the steel industry collapsed as my dad um, wanting me to go to college. All of those jobs went away and we became the Rust Belt of the United States. And I went to school and left home and everything that I knew and wanted to be an actor. And that almost didn't happen until somebody ticked me off one day standing in a hallway outside of a faculty member's office. They said something to me that upset me, and I responded to them using the language of South Philadelphia. If you don't know what that is, you don't need to know it here. <laughs> but I responded to him in the voice that I used at the time when I was angry, which sounded something like this. And a little man with a cigarette in his mouth, because they smoked then, walked out of his office and went, who said that? And I said, it was me, because I had some integrity <laughs> and he said, say it again. And I said, you want me to repeat that? And he said, yeah. So I did it like I'm talking to you now, mm -hmm. in the not scary mic voice. I went, OK. And he said, not like that. Say it like you just said it. I said, what do you mean? He said, like down into it. You mean like this? He said, yeah. He said, how low can you go? And I went, well, it was lower than I went, well, I don't know. Because I was a goaltender. I just scream at people all the time. Get him. He's got the buck. He's going to hurt me. <laughs> <laughs> And so he said, can you do that anytime you want to? And I said, yes, absolutely. And he said, get in here. Why don't you talk like that always? And I said, well, because the voice teacher, Mr. Kearns, told me I had to talk. He said, that's ridiculous. The way you look and at your size, you should sound like that. You could work. That's the beginning of my career. Guy broke his leg. I sounded like a Hispanic guy. I got to kiss a girl. I swore in the hallway. <laughs> I became a Shakespearean actor because I can't dance. <laughs> and he said, you, you can't sing and dance. Well, I could sing a little bit, but I can't read music. I don't want to see you dance either. I, <laughs> I don't want to see you dance. He said, you know what a broadsword is? Yeah, I've seen a broadsword. It's your new best friend. I was a first generation high school graduate, and I was going to spend my career doing Shakespeare. That was weird. But I learned to love Shakespeare, and I learned to love classical drama. And I graduated BFA from Penn State, went and worked in Ashland Shakespeare Company in Ashland, Oregon, and Camden Shakes and Shakespeare in Camden, Maine. I got to go to Alaska and Nevada and all of these wonderful places doing Shakespeare, Georgia, Kansas. I went and got a master's degree because I knew I wanted to teach like you. But I wanted to be able to do it first, so I worked professionally. Then I went back and got a degree to teach. Then I went to Lubbock, Texas, of all places, at Texas Tech, and worked on a doctoral degree. So I have degrees in theater, which most people would consider a waste. And occasionally around here, when I showed up here for this job, people would say, you can't get a job if you're not in a STEM field. And I would tell them, I was the dean then, well, I'm your boss. <laughs> 
And I didn't ever take college algebra. Anybody in that book? <laughs> you never took college algebra, and I've heard from the day I walked in here, you don't get college algebra, you don't get a good job. Well, that's interesting. Go back and teach your class. <laughs> because, and this kind of brings us to what my father wanted me to take care of people, and I, I still respect my father's choice. He wanted me to use my mind to help people, and artists, actors, that's kind of what they do. Actors and priests and teachers have kind of similar jobs, and arguably doctors. And we have this kind of agreement. We're going to help the world, and we're going to try to do it without hurting anyone as much as we can. Although we know if you're a doctor or you're a teacher, sometimes you have to challenge things that people believe to be true, something that kind of pushes them. I've heard it said that great learning begins in chaos. The knowledge that you don't know something and the fear that you must in order to do something valuable. And so what my dad wanted me to do, he came and saw me once, and he was OK. And he went, yeah, that. So every day, although I don't work in a theater, and I wish I did more, but every day, I get to do what my dad wanted and what Bill Kelly taught me with a cigarette hanging out of his mouth, besides using my voice. And what I learned in the theater which was that we have to collaborate, we have to work together, we have to create new solutions that have never existed before, at least not for us. Mm. And the goal has to be bigger than any one of us. So in hockey, if you play for yourself, you lose, because the puck moves faster than every skater. Mm. And in the theater, the piece that's performed by the individual without the rest is a monologue, which I'm running too long on. <laughs> but it doesn't, it isn't a play because it takes you, if it doesn't take all of us, it takes all of us. And in my job as the vice president, that's what it is. Whatever makes me as successful as I am, and I would never argue I was great at what I do, but any success I have is because I understand I don't do much of anything by myself. And everything that we do, those of us in the room who work here, is really about the other people we serve, just as in a theater, everything's about the audience. What we do is about our students. And if you lose track of that, it's a pretty bad monologue. Yeah. So if you're wondering how you get from suburban Philadelphia and the Steel Kids to here, I don't know that there's a clean trajectory or pathway, and I wouldn't want you to follow mine. Not because it wasn't glorious, but because it's mine. But when someone tells you you can't have a career if you don't get college algebra under your belt and you don't major in a STEM field, they're just wrong. You can do whatever your passion and your gifts take you to do. For us, we get gifts, right? Mm -hmm. Blessings from wherever they come. What you do with them determines what kind of person you are in my mind. And if your gifts are in the arts, Use them there. That, okay, I'm done. <laughs> what's, what's up, James? Do you guys mind if I piggyback just a little bit? Uh -huh. on, and, and, uh -huh. Yeah, the boom, boom, boom. Um, one of the biggest lies ever told to young people, and my theater students are going to get in here, they've heard me say this 88 times. One of the biggest lies told to young people when, when, uh, when they tell their parents or whoever that they want to be an artist, any kind of an artist, really. Musician, sculptor, painter, actor, actress. I don't know if actors and actresses get this more, but the first reaction much of the time is, oh, you're not going to make any money doing that. You're, you're not going to make any money, you know. As though they knew, you know. Um, mm, I, and I take issue with that because um, most working actors and actresses are people that you have never even heard of. Mm -hmm. Everybody that pops up in a YouTube ad, everybody doing a voiceover over the radio, every, all of those people are actors and actresses. You can make a living doing it. People do it everywhere all the time. Okay, 
Um, <clears throat> that being said, it's contract work. You're not just a performer, you are also a, um, a salesperson, the thing that you're selling is you, and an independent contractor. And like all contract work, ask anybody who runs a mom and pop construction business here in town. With all contract work, it is feast or famine, okay? Um, but when it's feast, it's a big feast, you know? There's money to be made. Um, but, um, so, but people get discouraged because they think they, it's what they want to do versus what they think they should be doing. Does that make sense to everyone? I'm not gonna say it's not a tough racket, but um, if you eat, live, and breathe it, and you stick it out long enough, and you keep perfecting it, my gosh, you drop 50 hooks in the water, something's gonna bite. Yeah. So I just, you know, before we begin this discussion, what value does theater have outside of, you know, being a career theater person? Just know that being a career theater person is a very, very real yes. thing. Okay. To a lot of people. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I just say that whatever you want to be in your life, you can be. You just have to try and you have to fight. And it's going to be a lot of, there's going to be a lot of competition and it's going to be hard. But if you, if you want it hard, bad enough, then you'll, you'll succeed. Um, Clearly, I'm a little bit different from them in that I don't have a theater degree. Everything that I have learned is, is self-taught uh, with experience and reading and working with other actors. Um, and I've done that for about 15 years. Um, but it's something I wanted to do. And it piggybacked onto my education degree and my education experience. Um, I worked with people, little people, yes, but their parents as well for that <laughs> meant for 33 years. And so um, I could deal with people. And so in theater you have to deal with other actors and other actresses and the directors and you know the whole production staff. It's all in the same boat. So um, back to what I said at the beginning. Be what you want to be, just fight for it. And you can be successful in your life. And Lori, Sophocles didn't have a theater degree, and neither did Shakespeare. And I think Anton Chekhov was a doctor. Yeah. yeah. So where you be, I'm, I'm pretty sure I knew that. But <laughs> wherever you begin from, it's not nearly as important as what brings you to a theater. And that isn't nearly as important as what you do in the theater and what you take away from it, whether you're the audience or the actor. So there is no lesser there. Every day working in a theater after teaching the students or taking care of whatever else is going on, from mopping the floors to building the costumes to helping with the scenery to acting when that's what's required. But remember, for every job in the theater, in front of the lights, there are three jobs behind. And those three people are what make that thing run as well. So there are lots of careers in the theater. Questions or? Yeah. or Does anybody have any? Go right ahead. I, I really love the whole uh, panel. Okay. I mean, it's, it's so good to hear personal stories because most of the time when we lecture or when we listen to lectures, it's just you know, lectures. But this is right. very personal. I love it. And the question for every one of you, please, <laughs> is what is your favorite play and why? <laughs> oh, <laughs> just one. Have That's a great done? question. Have we done three women or? that like in general what is your as a person what oh, is your boy. favorite play and why don't make me go first okay <laughs> 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 i need a second wow you might need a favorite oh my gosh i have the a favorite one that i've done i do have a favorite one that i've done um and it was at theater off the square and after i left uh, high school i went and did acting professionally for a long time, but I have done more plays at Theater Off the Square than I have done anywhere. I think I, I think I'm at 14 or 15, mm. something like that. 
in the 10 years that I was a, or that, I'm, that I have been there, but I haven't done anything in about a year, sadly, because I decided to go back to school. <laughs> but that's okay, not sadly that's that not I decided sad. to go back to school, but that, it, that I haven't been able to act, and it, it makes me a little stir crazy. <laughs> but um, my favorite one that I did, I think it was, oh, four, oh my gosh, has it been four years, four or five years ago that we did Nonsense? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> my favorite one was Nonsense, and it's a musical, and it's about five nuns. And uh, uh, we had a we had a cook, and she killed like half of our or over half of our parish, and there was five of us left, or a convent, a convent, right. and there was only five of us left, and we didn't have any money to bury our sisters, so we had to put on a variety show so that we could bury our dead sisters. <laughs> what were there? Fifty-two, fifty-two dead sisters, and I played. Sister Robert Ann, and she. <laughs> <laughs> is she the novice? No, no she's no. The, she is the one from Brooklyn. Oh yeah. And as they that. talked about their accents, I didn't even admit accents are my favorite thing, and I do them a lot. Um, but I played her, and it was it just the the ex I hadn't done a musical since high school at that point, and that was probably seven years after high school, and I had a huge fear of singing in front of people. So much so that I went to like therapy to get over it, <laughs> um, and it was for that play. <laughs> when I found out that we were doing Nonsense and I wanted to be in it, I went to therapy so I could sing in front of people, and it worked. <laughs> and <laughs> having, I love big casts because it's so fun to have a giant cast, but for that show, there were five of us on stage, our director, our assistant director, and three other people, our lights and sound, and then our stage manager, and we had one person that was our stage crew. And it was one of the smallest shows I've ever been a part of. And to this day, if I see, any time that I see my director, um, if we are in a group and there's any of us that are there, we take a picture together because we're just like, the sisters, we're back together. <laughs> and then two years later, we did Nonsense too, and she had all of us come back so we could reprise our roles. Oh, that's Aww. great. Yeah, it was, and that's, that's why that was my favorite one because it helped me get out of my comfort zone of seeing in front of people, and it pushed me to do it because I probably would have never done that. And it gave me a whole new confidence in myself that I didn't have before. And because I'm a child of dyslexia, and I found out that whole being dyslexic as a child is why I had a fear of singing in front of people. So I don't know why or mm. how that it's about reading in front of people, and I don't know. Anyways, so mm. that it that whole experience, and then gaining my sisters, and we ranged in ages, and one of them was actually my cousin, Lori's daughter. Lori and I are cousins, <laughs> and. Um, and it was just, <laughs> and it was just one of the best experiences being with a small cast versus a giant cast, and gaining so so much from that one show alone. At the age that I was, I think I was like 25 at the time. So at that age, I was like, wow, I feel empowered. <laughs> so yeah, nonsense. There you go. <laughs> We're going down the road? Sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> sure. That's a really hard question. Because there are so many different genres to think about. But um, as far as one that I have not been in, um, Big Fish, the musical, is a favorite of mine. We did it at the theater, and um, my daughter, Jacqueline. Jacqueline, my daughter, Jacqueline, is the theater director at Weatherford High School. So for students. Oh. <laughs> um, and she and her husband were the leads in that and it's just a beautiful play and beautiful music and I even loved the story when I saw the movie and didn't even know there was the play that went along with it um, I'm sure everybody here is probably familiar with Big Fish so I, I just dearly loved that and then as far as me things that I have been in um, actually for me I always thought comedies are easier than dramas. For me, they were. Until this last role I, I was in just recently at Ripcord. 
um, at the theater. And it was most difficult because I had to learn the whole script because I was on stage the entire time. That's so hard to do. But after I got that handled I, and really got into my character, it was just an amazing story because of uh, what happened. It's two ladies that are in a retirement facility. And so I had to play an older lady and I did wear a white wig. It was really cute, but you know. Um, and they don't get along. And so my character was very spunky, very snarky, and that was way fun to play. In fact, people would say, I didn't know you could be so snarky. I'm like, that's acting. <laughs> and then I had some, we had some people come from a retirement center, and some of the gentlemen came up to me and said, uh, you know, I really like that in real life. <laughs> <video."> <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, it was the relationship between these two ladies. and. Clearly, I did not like the lady who lived with me in my room. And so um, we had to deal with that. And then I had um, a lot of very dark things that happened in my life, my character did. And uh, a son who uh, was into drugs in his younger years, and um, I was estranged from him, and this woman who lived with me brought him back to me. And that was a very emotional scene. Uh, with him coming back. So there was a lot of comedy, but a lot of really dark things as well. And so um, it was just an amazing play. And um, we had seen it, my husband and I had seen it at Circle Theater in Fort Worth. And when we saw it, in fact, one of the ladies that played the other lady in the, in the play, uh, I actually went to high school with in, oh. at Circle. Yeah, Deborah Brown. Um, and she was fabulous. But anyway, after we saw that play, we thought, oh, our theater needs to do that play because <laughs> it's just so good. So that's it. Record Big Fish, I guess. I like them. I have to narrow it down to plays that I've done and not just plays that I like. Mm -hmm. um, my favorite experience, I, I, I suppose, uh, I was in this play down in Austin called Post Oedipus. And what it was, was it was um, a postmodern, read this is going to sound really artsy, a postmodern reworking of a play by uh, Euripides called The Phoenician Women. Okay? And the Oedipus stories are about <clears throat> the fall of a, of, a, of a noble Greek family, okay? the house of Cadmus. Uh, long story short, if you don't know the story of Oedipus, it's, he, uh, uh, through no fault of his own, uh, he becomes king of uh, Thebes. Thebes, thank you. Uh, he becomes king of Thebes, but, but in doing so, um, he, he kills his father and marries his mother and has not one, not two, but four <laughs> children by her. Ew, yeah. right? Yeah. Right. But here's the tragedy. The tragedy is that he does not know and has no way of preventing it. By the time he finds out, his children are practically grown, okay? Once he discovers it, he goes a little crazy and gouges out his eyes. But that's not the end of the story. It does not end with him, yeah, Oedipus Rex ends with him gouging out his eyes, but there are more stories after that. The Phoenician Women takes place after his self-blinding, and he is still alive, and his sons are warring over his kingdom. Okay, uh, it's postmodern, so we didn't look very Greek, um, but Oedipus in this play was not quite all there. He was a very sad old man with a tape recorder duct taped to his chest that he played self-help tapes on. <laughs> Which sounds really, really funny, and it was, but when you, when you look at that, you know, once you're done laughing, you go, oh. you know, it, does, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And, and, and uh, uh, so if, if you don't know, theater is a lot of things, but the main thing it is is a study of the human condition. And it's a study and an experiment that we do with our castmates on stage, but also with the audience. Okay? Uh, 
Um, and when the audience is with you, when Oedipus finally, at the end, hangs himself, many tears, many tears. And if you've done it right, they don't even necessarily know why they're crying, okay? When that happens, you know that they're with you, and you know that they get it, and you've done your job. And so, I, and so I think, I think that the, uh, that moment, I think that moment that I got to experience every night of of them being there with me and not wanting me to die, but at the same time realizing that it had to happen. Uh, that's what's rewarding. You know? Yeah, yeah. My that, that, that's my favorite play experience. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. I've done a, a lot of shows, and a lot of Shakespeare, and my favorite is the simple version is King Lear. It's the tragedy of King Lear by Shakespeare. And if you've never actually experienced it, not watched it on tape or video, but been in a theater live when it's performed, it's his, to me, it's the grandest piece he ever wrote. And the one, the thing that makes it grand is that it's a king, it's that it's a play about families and about the destruction of families, and also the love of families, and people don't necessarily know that until you've, you've experienced the play, the way it was written. It's very, it's funny. It's got funny yeah. stuff in it. Yes, it does. But, and ultimately, like most of Shakespeare's tragedies, it comes around to something very simple. Your life is a gift, and you have an obligation to live it to its fullest, and you never get to quit. And in fact, most of the time, you don't really get to drive. You really just get to live the life you have and make the best choices you can. And everybody makes mistakes and everybody dies. But you get to learn from your mistakes and you get to make choices about what you do after you make them. And that really is the measure of a human being in King Lear. And um, having gotten to play Lear once uh, and gotten to work with a great actor who played it in the theater that I worked in, but I wasn't in the production. Um, it is one of the most difficult plays to produce in any age. I, I would imagine in Shakespeare's age, too. But in our age, it's very difficult because it, it leaves so little to hide from. But when you come down to its most critical scenes, the actors have to be. A lot of people think that actors pretend to be other people. Well, I suppose some do. But um, that isn't what I was taught to do. Actors strip away all the parts of themselves that aren't relevant to the characters that they're playing right. so that they can expose the humanity of the character that the playwright has written them in connection with other human beings who are doing the same thing in front of and with other human beings who are bearing that part of their souls to you. And there is nothing more enervating more enriching, in my experience, than realizing that everyone falls. But everyone can, through a choice of spirit, rise again, even if it costs you everything that most people think of as life and importance. You can rise again. And be, that's what Oedipus does, right? right. Yeah. That's what, and um, coming back to the original issue of why we're here, um, that may seem grand and pretentious, and I suppose it is. Some people have accused folks like us of being overly dramatic. <laughs> but there's also something that speaks to integrity in that. And if you've had the experiences we have had, and if you've had them yourself, they don't have to happen in a theater. Um, the opportunity to understand yourself in relationship to something that is greater than you and the obligation that that creates it has been profoundly moving in my life. And the theater was a gift to do that in, as so many things are. And so the Lear, particularly, does that. And there's not a person in here who couldn't fit into Lear somewhere. Brilliant piece of writing. And not meant, for all respect to the English teachers who teach it, not mm -hmm. meant to simply be sat and read. That's just the best things we can do in high school because we don't have the plays and we don't have everyone. And it's better than doing nothing. But it isn't as good 
as watching a rehearsed cast or being part of a rehearsed cast, living Lear. I got to do this. I'll make it quick. I got to play Lear with a young lady who was playing Cordelia, who also played Fool. She was wonderful. Yes. That's Lear's youngest daughter, Misty. Yeah. Yeah. In a very small theater where the audience was this close to me. Us. And when I came out at the end of Lear after Cordelia's been hanged, and Lear is carrying her out and wishing that the only thing in life that he would want is for her to breathe again. That's all he wants. The king is, is just make her breathe again. I'll give everything. He essentially says, I'll give everything I can. Just let her breathe again. Her mother was sitting there. Mm. And her father was sitting there. Her real mother and father. And I was holding their daughter. And all three of us were bawling our eyes out. But I had to talk. <laughs> <laughs> but Nathan, her dad, was this wonderful guy. Mountain of a human being. A sweet guy just bawling his eyes out. Um, um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> My parents can't watch me if I, like, I've done several horror films that I die in and they can't watch it. That's, They'll watch that's everything and fast forward. That's understandable. Yeah, My dad didn't recognize it. it. <laughs> he, would, he would come to the theater and my mom would have to go, that's him. <laughs> <laughs> moment either in your personal life or in your work life where your acting, your theater experience has helped you navigate something either difficult or tricky? I had one a few weeks ago. Yeah. <laughs> is that a is that a person? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. I think, I think happy you've story. heard about it. Now a happy story. <laughs> um, in the theater you're taught to stay in character and you can't break character. Well at up front uh, in the student services office we help and see everybody that comes through the college and a few weeks ago there was just three of us in there and i was sitting up front just typing away and then this man came in and just walked to, up to me and asked me if um he told me that he needed to help or find out if his daughter had anything left on her account they needed to clean it up and and um i said okay well we can we can look that up since she was killed in december and i was like and he started to tear up a little bit, and he just kind of looked away and said, I wasn't going to do this today. I said, you take all the time you need, and I just didn't break character. <laughs> and then I helped him. I think he was in there for maybe 10 or 15 minutes, and I just tried to make that process as smooth as possible for him, told him where he needed to go, and showed him where the business office was to make sure there wasn't anything left on his account and I made it until the door closed and then I cried. <laughs> and uh, that was that was a moment that I didn't even realize my theater training came in until we had our meeting because this happened the morning that we the four of us met to discuss this panel and I was like well yeah that definitely helped me today because I had to stay composed because I mean that I don't, um, I can't even imagine how that was probably one of the most difficult things he had to do that day. And if I would have lost it, it certainly wasn't going to help him any. So that's one situation where my training came in, came in handy. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? I'll tell you a story, but it wasn't about it worked. I'm going to tell you about how it went badly. And I never used to tell this story to anyone. I can tell you stories about ripping my pants out in front of 600 people <laughs> and having them go, oh, yes, if you were all proctologists, this would be appropriate, but it isn't. Um, that's a whole other day. This, this happened. Hopefully, it won't take too long. I had finished working as a professional actor in some places, and I was going, was married and going to a church in Wichita, Kansas. It was very, very large. And they were going to do a singing Christmas tree at uh, the Wichita Convention Center, which seats, I don't know, thousands of people. And it's a big metal thing, and a bunch of people in the choir all stand on and sing Christmas carols. And they wanted to have a living nativity standing beside the Christmas tree. I was younger, and all my hair was on top of my head, not in my ears and coming out of my nose. So, and it was long and dark. And, and uh, the music minister said, at the front of the church made a call, we need someone to play Joseph in the Living Nativity. And my wife looked at me and I went, all right, I went down and talked to George at the front of the church and said, hi, I said, can I help you? And I said, well, yeah, but 
kind of asking if I could help you. He said, with what? And I went, living activity? And he went, oh, yes! And I thought, yeah, because I look like those guys. <laughs> <laughs> I don't look like you. I'm not that clean-cut white guy with no beard or mustache with really short hair. So understand, I entered this with arrogance because I'm a professional actor. And I'm mad because I look more like Middle Eastern men than you do. <laughs> so he said, now you're going to have to stand in front of a lot of people. Are you going to be OK with that? And of course, I wasn't going to tell him. I'm a professional actor. I think I'll be OK. I just went, yeah, I'll be OK. He said, good. Well, we would love to. What's your name? I told him, OK. I didn't tell him I was working on a master's degree down the street at Wichita State University. And I just figured, keep it all packed up. So we did the rehearsals. And I rode my motorcycle the rehearsals in my army jacket and my leather boots. And I met the baby Jesus and her mom, because Jesus was a little baby girl. And her dad did the lights for us. And I went, oh, this is cool. And people stayed away from me because I looked like I looked. Mm -hmm. And I went, that's fine. Mm -hmm. I'm OK with that. And then I, I realized people were hanging around the baby because we rehearsed at night, and it was making the baby fussy. So I started standing next to the, the mom and the baby. And people would kind of lean away from them. And I went, oh, good. The baby's going to get some rest. <laughs> and the mom kind of got that. And she realized they didn't invite we were friendly. So we went, and we did this thing for weeks, a couple of weeks before Christmas. And so we went out, and they did the tree, and blew all hundreds of people singing. And we're standing with literal camels and a girl suspended with wings on, doing the flying angel. And it's a real freaking manger with hay and a bassinet covered in hay. And I'm standing there in the little robe with the sh shepherd's crook. And mom's sitting over there. And, uh, and we're doing, you know, basically a tableau for an hour and a half while people are singing. And the baby's in the bassinet, and it's late at night, and the baby's got hay fever. So the baby's crying a lot because it doesn't want to be there. And she was crying one night, and her mom was just worn out. And I said, go pick her up. And she said, I can't. I said, why not? It'll ruin it. And I went, pick her up. And she said, I just can't. And I said, I can. She looked at me with that fear and hope that people have when they want something, but no, they shouldn't. And she looked at me and I said, what are they going to do to me? Because I'm big and scary looking. So I went and picked the baby up. And I walked her out of the manger. And for the next, I don't know how long it was, patted the baby. And she fell asleep on my shoulder. And I took care of the baby and ruined the nativity. Absolutely <laughs> ruined it. And when the thing was over, just before it was over, because I got timing, I took her back and gave her to her mother. And we finished it, and I waited for someone to walk up to me and tell me off about ruining the nativity. Because you knew it was going to happen. Because I don't look right. And I, I'm, I'm ready. So people are falling out of this thing, and they're leaving. And this guy comes down in some seersucker suit with two kids, young men, trailing behind him, and a wife, because it's clearly a nice nuclear family. Mm -hmm. And he looks at me and goes, Joseph. And I went, yeah. He said, I need to talk with you. And I went, okie doke. I'm ready. I was a bouncer in Reno, by the way, before I was worked at Wichita, Kansas. So I got paid to throw down. So I'm ready to go. And he said, I need to talk to you. And then he said, just blew my mind. He went, wait for me in the car, please. And his wife went, OK, take that. And I went, you just dismissed your wife so you could talk to me? That's good, because you don't want to have them watch what's about to happen. <laughs> the rest of these people are going to get to see it, but go ahead. So he said, I need to talk to you. And I said, go ahead. He said, I watched what you did just now. And I said, mm hmm He said, that baby is not your baby. And I went, no, she's not. He said, I know her father. We're good friends. That baby, her dad runs the lights. And, and I said, yeah, that's right. He said, it's not your baby? I said, no. He said, and my wife and sons were here and watched you do that. And I said, mm-hmm. He said, and they watched you pick that baby up and carry that baby out of that manger scene. And I watched you do that. And I said, yeah. He said, and that baby is not your baby. And I thought, yeah, we've established that. <laughs> he said, that baby is not your baby. And he kept saying that. And his face was really, really red. And he said, and my sons watched you do that. And I went, yeah. And he said, my boys. I said, yeah. He said, they're my boys. And I said, yeah. He said, 
they're my boys and I've raised them all their lives. And I said, yeah. He said, so they're my boys, but they're, they're not my boys, but they're my boys. And I said, yeah. Okay. He said, and when you picked that baby up out of that manger, I realized you were not their father. And I said, no. And he said, but you're Joseph. And I said, mm-hmm. And he said, Joseph wasn't really Jesus' father either. And I said, no, he wasn't. And he said, when I watched you pick that baby up out of that manger and I realized you were Joseph, I realized, and he just burst into tears. He said, I'm like Joseph. I said, uh-huh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and in the most broken voice he could muster, he said, I want to thank you. And I stood there in front of that man and all those people as ashamed as I ever should have been because all of the arrogance and all of the anger and all of the surety that I was right about standing in front of people, just, it doesn't matter what you believe, to me it mattered, put me in absolutely the right place to do everything wrong I possibly could have, except maybe pick up the baby. That was all I needed to get right. Everything else I got wrong, but that one thing. And in that moment, it was like somebody touched me on the shoulder. And you could call it whoever you want. I know what I thought it was. <coughs> and went, this isn't really about you. I just use you to do the things I need you to do. Now, it doesn't also really matter if you do them all wrong as you do them with love in your heart. I can use all your bad mistakes, too. Just would be nice if every once in a while you actually listen. Yeah. And so, since then, um, there have been a lot of wonderful lessons, Crystal, that have come from the theater when I've used them in my life, but very few of them measure up to the things that moments where the audience taught me to be a better human being than I am, mm -hmm. and that my obligation remains consistently that, and I fail continuously. But. I am thankful for grace and for forgiveness and for the opportunity that I have to work with so many people who use my idiocy to do wonderful things here at the college and, and the world beyond the places that I'll never touch. So that's my, I used to tell that story because people are gonna, you know what? It's the best story I have. So there you go, what you got? Well, we're actually out of time. Yeah. Oh! <laughs> Yeah. We'll do this Sorry. next week. <laughs> Is there anything else you want to know that we should tell you before we call out of here? He can answer in five minutes. What's that? How do you uh, like start doing it professionally like outside of doing like uh, community theater? Go and audition for everything. Everything. I went on over 500 auditions in six months. Mm -hmm. When I started, like four. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Maybe. Do it. Do and two it. of them were print jobs. They weren't even acting. I stood there and smiled and held something. Like. Hey, it's a gig. It is. It is. The first <laughs> time I walked behind somebody. Like, the first gig yeah. opens the door to the next one. Mm -hmm. right. So remember, every gig is important, no matter what they ask you to do. Yes. You can never turn out a part you didn't audition for and they didn't ask you to do. And if you don't do it and behave like a decent human being. I don't care how talented you are, they're not going to ask you that. They're not going to ask no. you that. <laughs> so when you hear stories about prima donna actors and performers who are miserable to work with, one day, they were either very, very lucky, and I don't know how that worked, or one day they were actually decent human beings and they changed into that because I've never worked in a theater where that attitude or behavior really resulted in success. Have you? It doesn't work anywhere. Russell Crowe doesn't work anymore. Yeah. It's yeah, not right. yeah. So audition, audition, bake if you need to, ride the horse, do whatever ridiculous thing they ask you to do. That's not immoral, legal, or impossible. Yeah. And when they say, I want you to do exactly what I expect you to do, mm -hmm. do it. Mm -hmm. And then show them the thing they didn't expect you to do. 
You know? You can do it. Let's see. You can do it. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's one of our camps. Everybody's yeah. got two good minutes. They just don't necessarily know which two minutes they are. <laughs> good point. And I would say, I don't do anything. Or I mean, people say, I've got this psychology degree. But uh, the same things, if I could have a theater degree, I would be doing the same thing. So yeah. every day. Applying that, knowing about the human condition is so valuable. No matter what you do, you're going to have those moments mm -hmm. that you've got to connect with someone. And that's what I like about the Uwe technique is the first thing you know you do is to know yourself so that you can find humanity in yourself. When you know that, then you can know that character's humanity. So how many of you are theater majors or art majors? <laughs> oh, good. I don't know the rest. <laughs> What do you do? You sing. Music major. Yeah. What do you do? Business marketing. Just yeah. hang out? What do you do? <laughs> <laughs> huh? No shame. Social services. And you're here because they required you for some class, is that it? Just no. for interested. No. Okay. What do you do? No. Mm -hmm. He's an education. He's from Brazil. From Brazil? English yeah. is he? Learning English. <laughs> oh, good luck with that. <laughs> English is here. <laughs>